Father, our God, how grateful we are for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth, to have your word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, for the privilege, O oh God, of confessing and repenting of our sins and walking in a new direction of life. We need you to teach us now what you would have us do. Speak, O oh Lord, in such a way that those who are confused would have clarity. Those who are struggling will find strength. Someone deliberating would have some discernment. O oh God, that we would leave this place on fire as witnesses of your word and the grace that you bestow upon us freely in Jesus Christ. Speak through your servant. As we are listening in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I want to let you know at the beginning, I'm really excited about the lesson of life that God has pressed on my heart to share with you today. I don't believe it's one of those rock the pulpit and run down the aisles kind of sermons, but I do believe it's going to enhance, encourage, and enlighten your everyday experience. And I want you to journey with me today as we walk through what is really a very profound teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that comes to us from the words of our Savior in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your app or your Bible, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 5, that we might hear a reading from our Savior beginning in verse number 38. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 38. It is our custom to ask those who are physically able to stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's holy word from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 38. If you've got a good Bible, that ought to be in red right there. That ought to be in red. And let you know Jesus is talking. Here are the words of the Lord from the New King James Version of the Bible. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But if whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you. From him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Look at that 41st verse again. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Somebody say the second mile. The second. You may be seated in the presence of God. I want to teach about the second mile. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 give to us one of the longest speeches of Jesus in his earthly ministry that we've entitled and labeled the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount really ought to be required reading for every born-again believer. If you haven't read it recently or you haven't read it at all, your homework assignment at the very beginning of this sermon is to make certain that when you go home, you read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. For in it, you will find that Jesus, in this Sermon on the Mount, is really teaching about the laws of righteous living. He's not talking about how to become saved, He's not talking about what you do in worship, not sharing with you how. You come to confess your sins, but rather Jesus, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is taking a moment to teach his followers about the road to discipleship, sharing with them the expectations of what God has for us as we identify ourselves as those who have faith in and follow our Lord and our Savior. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 really does lay out the requirements of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's really important that Jesus stops here in chapter 5 to give us the Sermon on the Mount because you will find in chapters 1 through 4 that all of those who have followed Christ have really come to follow him very easily. It has cost them nothing. Watch the road to discipleship. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee sees Peter and Andrew, and they drop their nets and go and follow Jesus. It's just that easy. Then he runs up on James and John, the sons of Zebedee, calls them, and they leave their father's business to follow Jesus. It's just that easy. Then over the next few chapters, Jesus begins 
working miracles in the sight and the presence of those in Galilee. He, he heals the sick. He raises those who are paralyzed. He gives sight to the blind. He casts out demons. The Bible says with all of that that people are seeing, this great crowd begins to follow Jesus because they're excited about this thing and this person called Jesus Christ. Everything is good. Everyone's enjoying the journey. It's, it's good sailing. It's a good time. We like the road to discipleship. And up until now, you could have the misperception that following Jesus is easy. And so the Lord pulls this crowd aside to share with them, although it's been easy thus far, and although becoming saved was easy and following me was easy, I want to let you know that there are some laws of righteousness, some expectation of believers, some thing God desires of us that are not so easy to do. And so Jesus pulls them aside to begin teaching and talking about the road to discipleship. And you will note two things about the Sermon on the Mount. The first is that in these laws of righteousness, when Jesus lays out what God expects of us as we walk in faith and follow him, you'll notice that the bulk of the Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with your relationship with God, but rather your relationship with other people. That as Jesus lays out what the Lord expects of us, the bulk of the teaching is not about some professed religion, but rather about some proven relationships with other people. That the first and primary expression of our faith and our fellowship is not how loud you shout, not how many Sundays you come to church, it's not how big your Bible is. But the first proven expression of your faith and your fellowship is how you deal with and interact with other people in your daily experience. That in a real sense, here's what Jesus says in the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not how loud you shout, but how deeply you love others. That at the end of the day, what matters to the Lord is not just your worship, but your relationship with other people, which is to suggest that you can't say you love the Lord and treat folk any old way you want. Go on, preach, Pastor. You can't get up in church talking about giving honor to God who's ahead of my life, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and then you cussing folk out at your job on Monday through Friday. You, you can't carry a Bible and, and shout in the sanctuary and then be meeting the folk and nasty all week long because that's not a sign of faith and fellowship. That the primary way we prove our walk with God is how we treat other people. You know what you're telling You better be nice to me. You better be nice to me. That, 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 it's all about our relationships with others. And the second thing you'll find amazing about the Sermon on the Mount is that everything Jesus asks us to do to prove we are following him is not the easiest thing to do. As a matter of fact, you, you will continuously hear Jesus say this in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said, but I say unto you. That Jesus is presenting another way of life that is not always easy or instinctive. As a matter of fact, discipleship, my brother and my sisters, oftentimes calls and commands you not to do what you want to do and to do what you wouldn't normally do. I'm going to say that again, Pastor. That discipleship oftentimes calls and commands you not to do what you want to do and to do what you would not normally do. Look, look, look at how Jesus talks and what he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. As he introduced it, he said, listen, listen. He said, you know what? Be careful of what comes out of your mouth when you're angry. Now, that's, that's counterintuitive for about half the folk on your pew. Many of us, the minute we are mad, we are justified in believing that we got the right to say what we ever we want to say, and we'll repent about it on Sunday at altar call. Jesus says, when, when people do you wrong, forgive them. 
Now, that's not instinctive. My natural proclivity is to hold a grudge and to be bitter with you. Jesus teaches and says, listen, listen, stop looking and lusting. I knew it was going to get quiet. I knew, I knew right, right that day it was going to get a little bit quiet in church. He said, the looking and lusting leads to some stuff you ain't got no business doing. He says, watch what you say. Don't swear about nothing. Just do what you say you're going to do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If you have no intention of doing it, then don't tell me you're going to do it, but have some integrity to your word. He says, and love your enemies. Watch this. There's no trophy for loving folk who love you. Even the Pharisees do that. But if you want to prove that the love of Christ rests within your heart, you've got to learn to love those that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and bless them that would curse you and help them that would reject you and embrace them that would walk away from you. That's not easy to do. Then to kind of succinctly summarize some of these expectations, in our verse number 38 through verse number 42, Jesus really lays out four expectations of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Four things God expects of us to do in our daily living. Four things that mark us and represent the faith and the fellowship we have in Jesus Christ. Can I teach you four things that God wants you to do this morning? The very first thing, watch what he says. The very first thing, you still got your Bible open? Come on, walk through scripture with me. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Here's the first thing Jesus says that marks you. You resist revenge. Now, this, ain't, this ain't shout, but I'm gonna help somebody today. Cause, cause. The sermon is already preaching to you right here and right now. Because the one thing we live for and like to do is get even with folk. Come on, can we be real for a minute? Take your sanctified, hypocritical look off. Don't nothing feel better than getting somebody back. Give them a little taste of their own medicine. Matter of fact, somebody on your pew's got a PhD in revenge. You have mastered the art of serving people back what they gave due unto others as they have done unto you. And you know folk got a PhD in revenge and go to church, they throw scripture on it. The Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yes, the Bible does say it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it three times in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But people who quote that as a reason and a rationale for revenge don't understand Scripture. When the Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the Old Testament, that is called the law of Talion. Let somebody say Talion. You come to Out Street to learn T-A-L-I-O-N, the law of Talion. The law of Talion was given not to commend and encourage revenge, but rather, Deacon Karen, to limit the extent of personal revenge. Make sure you catch this. When the Bible says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it's not saying that if someone's done you wrong, you ought to do them wrong. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the law of Talion, is meant to set a limit on how much revenge you could exact upon someone who had done you wrong. It doesn't say you ought to, but it says if you do, here's how far you can take it. If someone has taken one eye from you, you cannot take two eyes from them. If someone has taken one tooth from you, you can't take all the teeth out of their mouth. <laughs> that the law is meant to limit how much revenge you can seek, that you can only seek as much revenge as the offense you had received. One eye for one eye, one tooth for one tooth. The law was not meant to say that if someone takes an eye, you take their eye. It was meant to limit how much you would take. So when Jesus says, you've heard it say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, what he's teaching us is although there is a law that limits how much revenge you could seek, I'm asking you to take it to another level and not seek any revenge at all. Here's what the Lord said. You don't have to get even. You don't have to take an eye for an eye. You don't have to take a tooth for a tooth. When someone has slapped you, Jesus says, 
let it go. Can I push this? Can we teach? Notice what Jesus says. Here's deep. Here's deep. He says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, someone say the right cheek. Now, now, I need you to, to look at me, make sure you understand this, because in the Bible, we never talk about left-handed action. In the Bible, everything is done with the right hand. Are you with me? And so if I'm facing you, Jamal, and I want to slap you on the right cheek with the right hand, the only way I can slap you on the right cheek with the right hand is to back slap you. Are you with me? Don't make me have to call you up here to prove a point. <laughs> it, if someone is in front of you and they're going to slap you on the right cheek with the right hand, the only way to do it is to back slap. Now in the Bible, a back slap is not an injury, it's an insult. So what's the depth of what Jesus says? He's not saying if someone injures you, let it go. He says something deeper. If somebody insults you, if somebody disrespects you, if somebody calls you out of your name, if somebody mistreats you. And let me tell you, that's a word because sometimes the insult hurts more than the injury. Can I preach real here? Because the injury will heal, but the insult, that stays around. And you will remember the insult long after the injury. And here's what Jesus says, if somebody insults you, which would give you the natural desire to insult them back, Jesus says, resist revenge. Now, now, I need you to understand that Jesus is not saying that you ought to walk around life letting people abuse you. That we just passive and walk around life and allow folk to just watch what he says. He says literally, this is what Jesus says. If somebody slaps you. That's a big if. Because if it's a conjunction of possibility, supposing that it only happens under certain contexts, which means that Jesus doesn't say, just let somebody insult you. What he literally says is, if it happens, but that means, Dean Karen, I can put myself in a position where when I see it coming, that I can literally, within my Christian right, create a context that prevents the possibility of being slapped in the first place. Yeah, you ain't with me yet. I don't have to let you slap me. I have my right to put myself in a place where the slap is not a possibility, especially if I see it coming. So I'm well within my Christian rights not to take your phone call. I'm well within my Christian rights to block your number. I'm well within my Christian rights to see your invitation and say no thank you. I'm well within my Christian rights to come to 8 o'clock if you come to 11. I am well within my rights. Because there's nothing that demands I have to let you insult me. But if you do, I will prove my walk with the Lord by not slapping. Here's what Jesus says. Listen, resist revenge, let it go. Because whenever you seek revenge, you have switched teams from faith and fellowship in Jesus to now being on the team with the evil one. It says resist revenge because you know God will handle it. Let, let, let me help you. Um, the other day I got called into the office. Got called into the office at school because my, my oldest son had got into a little scuffle with, some, with another little boy. And you need to know, Deuce, Deuce is kind of big for his age. As a matter of fact, when you see his school photo, it looks like he was left behind a couple years. Um, <laughs> And he got into it, Mark, with, with, with a sixth grader, a kid a little bit older than him, but, but, but smaller. And, and they were talking smack on, 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 on the field, and the little boy pushed Deuce, and Deuce pushed him back. But because Deuce is bigger, when he pushed the boy back, the boy fell down and then started hollering and crying like, you know, he broke his leg or something, you know, just. 
You know, so here I'm, I'm getting called up to school and the other parents are in there and they, they having a fit, you know, and Deuce didn't hurt my son, he pushed him back, you know, and what y'all doing on the playground? And, and I'm saying, wait, 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 what, hold on, hold on, what happened? And, and the teacher says, well, the, the, the other boy pushed Deuce and Deuce pushed him back. I said, well, wait, wait, I don't understand what the problem is because see, I, I've been teaching my son a couple things and I taught him, you know, don't, you don't ever start a fight at school. But if somebody put their hands on you, you put them on the ground. That, 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 tell them you don't mess with no Wesley. That's just how we get down from the south side. That's how I taught my son. Somebody put their hands on you, you put them on the ground. Principal got mad at me, said, Pastor Wesley, you know they try to, you know, put that, try to put the religious thing on you. The pa Pastor Wesley, we, we have a, a no violence, zero tolerance for violence policy at the school. I said, what does that mean? He says, any child who touches another is going to get in trouble. I said, wait a minute, you mean tell me that, that if he puts his hand on my son, that my son can't put his hands back on him? They said, that's exactly right. He will get in as much trouble as the other boy. I said, that, that doesn't make no sense to me. That wasn't how I was raised. I was raised if somebody put their hands on you, you put your hands on them and you put them on the ground. He said, that's not how we operate here at this school. I said, well, maybe we need to go to another school because we. So, 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 I said, so what are you supposed to do? He said, well, if, if we want them to know that if a child touches them, rather than handling it on their own, they're supposed to come and tell a teacher and let a teacher handle it. I said, wait a minute, I want him to get this right. If he puts his hands on my son, you don't want my son to put his hands back on him. You want my son to go to the teacher and tell the teacher, why should he go to the teacher? And the principal said, because the teacher has authority over all the students. And your son ain't got to handle it if he knows how to go to somebody who's got authority over over the one who put his hands on him in the first place. Can I preach from the life of Jesus? The Lord says you ain't got to put your hands on nobody. You don't have to put your mouth on nobody. You don't have to get even with anybody. Take it to the one who has authority over every creature on the face of this earth and trust that God can handle them. So somebody say, resist revenge. He says, you don't have to put your hands on them. Trust God to handle that. He says, so if a man slaps you, let it go. Then the second thing, watch this, he says, and if a man sues you and wants to take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. The second thing Jesus says identifies is not only that we resist revenge, but number two, we have a selfless spirit. Somebody say selfless spirit. Now, Michelle, a lot of people may not understand what Jesus teaches here because we don't wear tunics and cloaks. So let me see if I can explicate. The tunic was the undergarment that a man would wear, similar to the robe I have on. The cloak was the outer garment that went on top of the tunic. Are you with me? The tunic is the undergarment. The cloak is the outer. According to Jewish law, you could sue me and take my tunic, but the law prohibited you taking my cloak. Because if you take my tunic and my cloak, then I'm... It's church. I am bare. And so the laws of Israel said you could take a man's tunic in court, but you had to leave his cloak so he could cover himself. Now Jesus was not advocating that we walk around bare. What he literally is saying is this, that if somebody is so desperate that they need your tunic, they probably need your cloak. And although it's your legal right to hold on to your cloak, sometimes you ought to give away your own rights because it's in the best interest of someone else. that you learn to be selfless. That you don't live life only thinking about what's in your best interests, but you identify yourself as having faith in God and fellowship in Jesus Christ by the fact that you can relinquish your rights in order to give someone what's in their best interest, trusting that God will provide for you. Paul picks that up the best in the New Testament 
Repeatedly, you'll find Paul advocating that we care for others more than ourselves. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, let us learn to esteem others more than ourselves, not looking just to the things of ourselves, but looking to the concerns of other people. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we have to learn to honor others more than ourselves. Jesus is advocating, listen, you've got to live your life in such a way that you know how to take care of others, that you know how to look after the interests of others. That I'm going to give it to you in Twitter form. Here, here's a lesson I live by in life, and I found out it's the hardest thing to press on people, but I want you to get it right. You can never go wrong making somebody feel big. Oh, pastor, you... You can't shout because you're trying to write that down. You can never go wrong making somebody feel special. You can never go wrong making somebody feel important. You can never go wrong stopping and giving somebody your undivided attention and conversation because even though they may not live at the level of life you live at, you will make them feel important enough to look them eye to eye and talk to them as a human being. That's why you ought to stop and talk to the janitor on your job. That's why you ought to talk to that homeless brother on the street. That's why you ought to honor that mailroom sister that brings the mail by the office every day. She may not have the biggest job, but you can't go wrong making people feel important. Well, let me tell y'all tell y'all a little story. Um, you know, I went to Duke University. I went to Duke University. Duke University is a private school in North Carolina, arguably the greatest school on the face of the earth. And, uh, and, and, and you had to know Duke, Duke was, uh, Marseille was very expensive. Duke was very expensive. And so you, you, had, you had two classes of folk at Duke. You had uh, the well-to-do, and then you had the rest of us. You had uh, the, 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 the cats that came with a lot of money uh, from wealthy families, and then you had us who were on scholarship grants, federal loan, and what was called work study. You had those who, who showed up with, with three series BMWs freshman year, and those of us that were begging for a bicycle to make it from class to class. There, there were two categories of folk who went to Duke University, the wealthy and the rest of us. Now, you need to know that w when I became a member, Cap outside fraternity, as a matter of fact, it was 23 years ago today at 11.37 p.m. that I crossed the burning sands, Cap outside fraternity incorporated. Amen, happy anniversary to me, 23 years, bless his name. 23 years ago today, okay, remember Cap outside fraternity, and when I became a member of Cap, we started a new program at Duke called Food Service Workers Appreciation Day. Food Service Workers Appreciation Day. We decided as a chapter that we wanted to honor those sisters and brothers that worked in the cafeteria because we looked at them and they looked like us. And so we decided for no reason at all we were just going to be a blessing to the food service workers. And so we petitioned the school to give them the day off and we volunteered to work in the cafeteria that whole day serving all the meals. We prepared a special dinner for them. We had a step show for them. We had a party for them and raised money and all the proceeds from the party we gave as a gift to the food service workers on Food Service Workers Appreciation Day. We did everything we could to make those who served us feel big. Now, there were some of our counterparts who were wealthier who looked at what we were doing and it did not make sense to them. Why are you serving in the cafeteria? Why are you giving them gifts? Why are you having a step show for them? It didn't make sense to them. And on the, on the outskirts, I'll be honest with you, it didn't make sense to us. But we found out that you can't go wrong making people feel important. Because when the semester came to an end, and your food points were kind of low, we would go to the cafeteria, and whenever they saw K.A. Sai, they said, baby, just go and sit down and eat. They let us slide with free food, and we found out when you sow into the lives of others and make them feel important and make them feel big, it always comes back to you. You can't go wrong making other folk feel big. So Jesus said, if they need your tunic, give them your cloak. Also, be selfless. Concern yourself with the welfare of others. Let me drop down. He says, resist revenge, have a selfless spirit. But then at the bottom, let's watch what he says. And if somebody asks of you, give. And he who wants to borrow, don't turn away. Resist revenge, have a selfless spirit. But watch the third thing Jesus says. Give generously. 
give to those who are in need. Here's the tweet. If you have the fiscal ability, you have the Christian responsibility to give. If you have the fiscal ability, you have the Christian responsibility to give to those who are in need. Now let me tell you how the devil blocks this from us. Because we see people in need and we try to play social worker and psychologist and have a discernment of whether they're worthy or not. You're so prophetic, you know what they're gonna do. I ain't giving them that money, they're just gonna go out and get drugs. They ought to pull themselves up like I did. That they don't deserve it. They got themselves in this mess, they ought to stay there. So we excuse ourselves from what Jesus says. That if we have the ability, we have the responsibility to give. Maybe, maybe it's that homeless brother when you pull up at the red light, comes to your window, and you act like you're on the phone and turn your head. It's that sister standing outside the job. You see her every day, and you won't stop to buy her a meal. What is your excuse for not giving? Can I meddle with you a little bit? And don't tell me it's because you tithe. Because you give on Sunday, you're not obligated to give to the one who asks of you. If you have the ability, you have the responsibility to give. I shared this at the 11 o'clock service but I want, on last week, but I want you all to understand something about giving. How many people ever heard of the Dead Sea over in Israel? The Dead Sea, anybody know the Dead Sea? Do you know why it's called the Dead Sea? Because the concentration of salt in the water is so high that no plant life, no marine life can survive in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea because it's even a higher salt concentration than the ocean. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Now, here's the amazing thing. Let me tell you where the water from the Dead Sea comes from. The water from the Dead Sea originates from the snow caps of Mount Hermon. And when the snow caps of Mount Hermon melt, they run down and form what is called the Sea of Galilee. Now, you know the Sea of Galilee because that's where Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishermen when Jesus called them. There is life in the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee receives water from the snow-capped mountains of Mount Hermon, and then it releases that water into the Jordan River. You know the Jordan River. That's where John was baptizing folk when Jesus came. And the Jordan River has life in it. There's plants in the Jordan River. The Jordan River then deposits its water into the Dead Sea, which now has no life. So here's a question you have to ask. If snow-capped mountains give fresh giving water to the Sea of Galilee where there is life that feeds into the Jordan River where there is life, how does life-giving water from Mount Hermon, the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River wind up as dead water in the Dead Sea? How is it that life can come from Sea of Galilee through the Jordan River and turn into dead water in the Dead Sea? Dead Sea. It's easy because this Jordan, the Dead Sea, has an inlet, but it has no outlet, which means once it has received the water, the sun evaporates it and the concentration of salt is intensified because the Dead Sea knows how to receive, but it doesn't know how to release. The Dead Sea knows how to get, but it doesn't know how to give. The Dead Sea knows how to ask, but it doesn't know how to be a blessing to somebody else. The Dead Sea knows how to beg for what it wants, but it doesn't know how to give to something someone else wants. And whenever you can give and not get and receive and not release, what God gave his life will turn to death in your hand because you know how to get, but you don't know how to give. You've got to know how to release what you have received. Otherwise, it dies in your hands. Resist revenge, have a selfless spirit, give generously. But here's where I want it to land. It's on that third thing that Jesus says. If a man compels you to go one mile, go two. Somebody say the second mile. Here's what Jesus says. Resist revenge, have a selfless spirit, give generously. But then here is the fourth thing that identifies you 
is having faith in God and fellowship in Jesus Christ. You exemplify excellence. You go the second mile. Somebody say the second mile. Now, to understand what Jesus is teaching here, you have to go back to the days in which Jesus taught, and those who heard him would have understood this, because it was a custom in that day that the Romans, who had taken over from the Persians, had adopted a policy that allowed for any Roman soldier or government official to call on a citizen and require them to carry their load for them for at least one mile. If you were standing in a crowd, a Roman soldier could pull you out and make you carry his burden for one mile, and you were obligated to do it. As a matter of fact, you've seen that happen somewhere else in the New Testament at the death of Jesus. Come on, Bible study. Jesus is stumbling with the cross, and the Roman soldiers compel the some Bible to Simon to carry the cross of Jesus because you could obligate somebody for one mile. One mile was what you were forced to do. One mile is what was demanded of you. One mile was what was compelled of you. One mile is what you had to do. And Jesus has the audacity to say, but you go too. Can we talk about that second mile real quick? That second mile means that I make a deliberate decision to go above and beyond what is demanded of me. That I live my life in such a way that I never just skate by at the bare minimum. That I never just do the little bit. But that I've made a decision to live my life always looking to exceed what the requirement is, to exceed what the demand is, to exceed what is written on my job description, to go above what people have asked of me to do, that one of the ways that marks me as a child of God is that I have an excellent spirit in me that says that all I have to do is not all I'm going to do because good enough is never good enough and just getting by is not getting by. That if God would be glorified in my life, I've got to learn to go beyond what is required and requested of me. You've got to go the second mile. Let me teach right here. There are two types of folk in church, two types of folk in life, two types of folk in the world. You ready? One milers and two. People who do just enough to get by and those who want to go exceedingly above and beyond. Those who accept mediocrity and those who live in excellence. Those who say that a C minus is passing and those that say anything other than an A is not acceptable. Those who are content just doing the bare minimum and those who want to go well above and beyond and take it to the next level. Are you a one miler or a two? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel distinguished himself because he had a second mile mentality. He had a spirit of excellence in him that distinguished him from the rest of the crowd. When you go the second mile, you pull yourself out of ordinary. You pull yourself out of mediocrity. You distinguish yourself from everybody else on your job because you've got a second mile mentality. Can I give you a tweet real quick? People who go the second mile are never the first to be laid off. Go on, say that again, Pastor. People who go the second mile are never the first to be laid off. You want some job security? Go the second mile. You want to be first on the list for the promotion? Go the second mile. You want your name to float to the top? Go the second mile. Go above and beyond what is required and requested and distinguish yourself with your second mile mentality. It requires that I make a deliberate decision to go above and beyond. But the second thing the second mile requires, watch this, is that I have an adjusted attitude. Oh, God, here comes some good teaching. Because Jesus says the first mile is forced on you. The second mile is voluntary. The first mile is what is demanded of you from the outside. The second mile, you'll only do that if you got something on the inside that says, I want to do more. 
People who go the second mile, Kathy, typically have a better attitude. They come to it with a different spirit. They approach it with the saying that I've got to do more than what is requested, that I'm going to exceed what is asked of me, that, that I don't know how to do less than, I don't know how to do just enough, I don't know how to do just get by, that there's something inside of me that says I've got to go above and beyond, that I have a better attitude. Because excellence, my friend, is not about performance. It's about attitude. Let me tell you what hinders and messes up so many people you know. They go to work and they, everything they put their hands on, they do it with a bad attitude. Show up every Monday with no joy in your face. Passive aggressive behavior. Every time somebody asks you to do something, you mumbling underneath your breath. Showing up to work 10 minutes late every day. If you know you're going to be late, you can't have a second mile mentality. There's got to be something in you that says, I'm going to do better. And when you go the second mile, here's how you know, Joe, you're, you're walking the second mile when you start surprising people around you. Imagine if you were a Roman soldier pulling you out of the crowd as a Jew to walk one mile with him. And after that one mile, he expects you to throw the weight down. And after one mile, you just keep on going. That you know you're operating in the second mile when you're surprising people. They expected less than, you gave them more than. They expected bare minimum, you gave them excellence. They expected you would leave right at 5 o'clock, you stayed till 5.15 because the job wasn't done yet. Got to have an adjusted attitude. Got to make a deliberate decision to go above and beyond. And the third thing I want to tell you about going the second mile, you've got to have the courage to be criticized. Hear me. Here's a tweet. People who live in excellence are always criticized by those in mediocrity. People who walk in excellence are always criticized by people who live in mediocrity. Can you imagine a Jew walking one mile with a Roman soldier, and after one mile, they decide to walk two? When they put the load down, if I know people the way I know people, there was somebody that said, now why you do that? Why you go above and beyond? You messing it up for all of us. That's what the enemy does when you want to walk in excellence. He surrounds you with people that are upset by your excellent spirit because excellence exposes mediocrity. Your second mile exposes their one mile. And they criticize you because they're not willing to go the second mile that you went. So they make your daughter feel like she's a nerd for getting an A. They make you feel like you're a brown noser because you work hard at your job. They say things like, you think you're better than everybody else because you show up on time and stay late. People who live in mediocrity are irritated by folk who walk in excellence. And they always try to get you to doubt whether that second mile was worth it or not. Why you do that? You didn't get anything from it. Why you do that? There's no reward in that. And understand, second mile mentality says, here it is, it's deep, that my second mile creates an invitation for my next opportunity. That whenever I go the second mile, it creates an invitation for my next opportunity to be blessed. And if I only go one mile, I won't receive the invitation for the opportunity to be blessed. Can I have some deep Bible study with you a minute? You still got your Bibles open? I need you to see something. This, this, this isn't for everybody, but if you catch it, you'll be blessed by it. Notice the progression of the scenarios that Jesus puts forth. He says, if you've been slapped, if you're being sued, if you're compelled to walk one mile and walk two, when someone asks of you, give. Okay, I want to make sure you see this. If you've been slapped and insulted, if you're being sued, 
if someone compels you to do something and you go above and beyond, when someone asks, you can give. I need you, I need you to see this. I need you to see this. Scenario one, I've been slapped. I've been wronged. Scenario two, I'm being sued. That's unfair. Scenario three, I'm being compelled, and yet I go above and beyond. And scenario four, I wind up in a place where if someone asks, I have enough to give them. Okay, okay, okay. you almost got you almost got you almost got Touch the name, tell them, you almost, you almost smart, you almost smart, you almost got this. That if I've been done wrong, if I'm being treated unfairly, if I go above and beyond what I've been asked to do, the end result is that I wind up in a situation where I have enough to be a blessing to somebody else because when I go the second mile and when I go above and beyond and when I press into excellence, the end result is that I wind up being so blessed that I can now bless other folk because my excellence has given an invitation for the next opportunity for me to rise in life. Okay, All right, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Let me see if I, I can explain it. I'll give you a testimony. Back in 2007, 2007, I was interviewing to be pastor of the Alpha Street Baptist Church. We were in a process there. Dr. Peterson had retired. Dr. Gunn was leading the church. Search committee had been formed, and I was a candidate. And I need to let you know, now that we're a few years removed, that we had some ups and downs in that process. Uh, it didn't always go smoothly as we'd anticipated. Uh, there were times... They didn't like me and I didn't like them and we had kind of fallen out with each other a little bit and it was the fall of the year and in the fall of the year I hadn't, hadn't heard from the search committee in, in several weeks. They hadn't, hadn't called me for another round of interviews. The last interview we had went bad and they didn't call me back. And so you know, I'm figuring this ain't gonna happen. Um, I don't like them, they don't like me. I'm not gonna be past Al Street Baptist Church. One Saturday, I had a real rough meeting at church with some deacons and what was then called the standing committee, and I was fed up. I was frustrated and tired. I didn't like them. They didn't like me. It was a rough week. I hadn't heard from y'all. <laughs> had a rough meeting with my deacons and standing committee. And I'm going to be honest. I woke up on Sunday morning, and I went to church, and I was mad. And I'm human. I was mad. I'm looking at deacons and standing committee members that I don't like and they don't like me. I ain't heard from y'all. <laughs> and I'm mad. And to make matters worse, I guess I didn't get the memo that it was vacation time and members weren't going to be in church that day, so attendance was low. So when I walked into church, now I'm really mad because I didn't prepare to preach. Ain't nobody show up. I'm looking at deacons and standing committee members that I don't like and they don't like me. I ain't heard from y'all. And I'm mad. And I'm sitting on my chair, and some said, you know what? You ain't got to preach hard today. The Lord understands. You know how we throw that on the end of stuff. <laughs> the Lord knows my heart. <laughs> so, you know, I'm mad. And I said, you know, I ain't, I ain't getting up here and preaching hard. I ain't losing my voice and sweating out my clothes today. You know, they ain't come to church. I'm just going to get up and... Tell them Jesus rose and let's get out of here. Ain't no need to, <laughs> no need to belabor the point. You know, I'm, ain't nobody at church. I'm looking at some deacons and standing commitments I don't like. They don't like me. I ain't heard from y'all. What's the point in going above and beyond? I'm just going to get up and do a little something. God is good. Praise his name. Push the pulpit and let's sit down. <laughs> and something said to me, go the second mile. Don't bring less than your best. If God gives you the opportunity, give it all you got. So I stood up. Attendance was low. Looking at deacons and standing committee members I don't like, and they don't like me. Ain't heard from y'all. And I preached anyway. Preached as hard as I could preach. Preached as best as the Lord would allow me. Preached until I felt like God said, well done. And when I sat down in that chair and gathered myself, I looked around, I saw Pat Wallace, <laughs> Joe Nickens, Deacon Jim Bender in the back, Rosette Graham sitting over in the overflow. The search committee had snuck up to church 
to sit in and see me on that Sunday as they were trying to figure out whether I was the one God was calling to Alfred Street or not. And, and I realized then that if I had only gone one mile, if I had shortchanged that opportunity for God, that the next door would never have opened in my life. You've always got to go the second mile. Somebody say the second mile. Because you never know when you're interviewing for your next opportunity. Here's where I close. Don't let the devil convince you that some situation is only worthy of one mile. Go the second mile. Exemplify excellence. Give generously. Have a selfless spirit and resist revenge. That's how we identify ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ.